dar inicio a este aseguramiento de la calidad en programas de ingeniería. Invitamos al ingeniero Humberto Gómez, quien estará moderando la jornada y presentará a nuestros invitados. Hoy nos acompañan invitados internacionales, Jamet Imet, Jessica Silwick, representantes de eBay de Estados Unidos. Asimismo, también saludamos a las ingenieras Angélica Burbano Collazos de la Universidad ICESI y María Gabriela Calle de la Universidad del Norte. Para todos aquellos amigos que están llegando a este recinto, les pedimos ubicarse sobre sus asientos y también utilizar nuestra logística por si necesitan traducción. Ingeniero, lo invitamos a este recinto. For the panelists, it's a pleasure to be with you in this important event. Welcome to Colombia and welcome to this event. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Bueno, muy buenos días. Eh, muchas gracias por la participación y estar aquí con nosotros en esta jornada eh, que hemos llamado, digamos, un espacio para hablar de acreditación y aseguramiento de la calidad. Hoy eh, tenemos la oportunidad de compartir eh, unas experiencias relacionadas con eh, los esquemas de acreditación internacional, especialmente eh, de, por parte de EIBET. Eh, y para hoy pues, nos acompaña un equipo eh, de parte de EIBET para hablarnos un poco, eh, no solamente del proceso, sino también de la transformación eh, que existe en el interior de los programas una vez decidimos apostarle por aseguramiento de la calidad internacional en este sentido. Vamos a tener una jornada de aproximadamente como hasta las 12.30. Primero una charla eh, por parte de nuestros invitados internacionales, a la cual ustedes podrán escuchar en traducción simultánea, tal cual como les, les han dicho. Eh, y luego un pequeño conversatorio eh, también en el idioma inglés. Así que, pues, muchas gracias y nuevamente, pues, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Eh, so, I would like to welcome our invited speakers from AVID. So, good morning. So, we have um, Jessica Silwick. Chief Financial Officer and Chief uh, Operation Officer for EBIT. Jessica, thank you very much for being here. And we also have Jane Emmett, Senior, Senior Director for Accreditation Operation of EBIT. Jane, thank you very much for being here. So as I just mentioned, we're going to have a, a lecture and we're going to have a presentation from Jessica and Jane. And after that, we will join Uh, will join me, Angelica and Maria Gabriela, to have a panel discussions with some critical questions about the value of accreditation. So thank you very much for being here. So, okay. Thanks. Gracias. Buenos dias. I'm Jessica Silwick. Um, this afternoon, along with my esteemed colleague, Jane Emmett, we are going to talk um, all things ABET, or as many things as we can ABET in the time allotted. Um, many of you in the room know ABET very well, many of you know a little bit, and many of you know very little. So I'm hoping that all of you will get equally as much beneficial information out of um, our presentation this morning, um, leave knowing a little bit more about ABET, and maybe even a little bit of excitement about the possibilities being involved with ABET could present to you and your graduates or even your students. So I'm going to go through who is ABET. So ABET is a dynamic organization with a focus on quality assurance. At a top level, ABET is a nonprofit. We are ISO 9001 certified. We are a quality assurance um, organization with a focus in higher education programs in STEM. But why are we that? We are that because through our work and our partnerships, we help to ensure the next generation of STEM professionals who are equipped to build the world in a better place than it currently is. And that's why we do what we do. So just to give some visuals, ABET is an ecosystem of many, many people and organizations. ABET is faculty. Faculty members make up a large part of who ABET is. ABET is the students and the assessment of their student learning outcomes and continuous improvement. ABET is a global citizen with a focus on sustainability. It is our purpose to try to make the world a better place and we firmly believe 
that we are doing that. ABET is our graduates. That's the sole reason that we really do what we do. And that's why many of us are in this room today, to ensure the quality education of our graduates and that they're equipped to be the problem solvers of tomorrow. We are teams. ABET is teams, teams of diverse individuals working together, appreciating the differences and the obstacles that each one of us face as humans in this world. ABET is industry. We have many industry partners, and we receive valuable feedback from our industry. Our industry partners are also our program evaluators, so they know what they're going to need in the future. They know what industry needs to be able to keep up with technology and all of the evolving technological advances, as well as situations that we find ourselves in as humans today in creating a sustainable world. Um, in creating diversity where people can appreciate and understand the importance of diverse teams. ABET is diversity. So again, that's one of our pillars. We support diversity in everything that we do and we encourage it. And my colleague Jane is going to get into a little bit more about how we are incorporating that into our criteria. And ABET is our programs. We are made up of programs globally around the world who have shown that their programs meet ABET's criteria and that they are producing the problem solvers of tomorrow. ABET is also our member societies. ABET is made up of 35 professional member societies, all of which you see on the screen in front of you. These member societies provide ABET with volunteers who create our criteria and also create, um, there are program evaluators come from our member societies and they also volunteer in other ways as well. They serve on our board um, and they also provide us with guidance in our standards that we set and our policies. And last but not least, Columbia is part of ABET. Cartagena is part of ABET. ABET has many accredited programs in Colombia. Um, ABET has program evaluators from Colombia, and we have program evaluators from Cartagena. We have programs in Cartagena, and we even have ideal scholars, which I'll talk about later, or people who graduated from a program that ABET offers from Cartagena. So as soon as you become a program, as soon as you become a PEV, as soon as you become an ideal scholar or someone who's been to one of our workshops or events, you are part of ABET's ecosystem. Now I'm going to go into a little detail about everything I just spoke about. So the first thing I want to talk about is ABET is our member societies. ABET is a federation of 35 member societies. All of these are large, professional, highly regarded societies that shape their professions. We get experts from their membership pool who work with us to create our criteria and maintain our criteria, constantly looking for improvements. We also get our program evaluators. So when someone comes onto your campus for a program evaluation, it is one of these professionals, one of these experts from these member societies that represent your profession. Our membership societies represent all of the professions that I just shown on the screen. We have over 1.5 million individual members globally. Again, they develop our criteria. That's a very large part. Because they are the professionals in the field, whether it be academia or industry, they understand the needs and they understand the environment. And they are the best individuals to be able to create our criteria to make sure that our graduates are getting everything that they need to be successful in their professions. Again, we recruit our program evaluators from the societies. Um, so our program evaluators apply to become program evaluators for ABET through their member societies. And then the member societies select individuals who have um, submitted an application and then ABET will train you on the criteria that you will be evaluating programs against. And again, there's other opportunities to volunteer with ABET. If you don't want to be a program evaluator, even though I highly recommend that you look into it, but you can serve on our board. 
We have different committees. So there's other ways to get involved with ABET. You can be a session leader at our ABET symposium. Um, you don't even need to be a member of a society to do that, actually. ABET is also industry. So ABET has a very esteemed industry advisory council that is made up of some representatives from some of the most technologically advanced and prestigious companies in the world. These individuals guide our ABET volunteers from the member societies to let them know what's happening in their organizations. What are their needs? What are they not getting from graduates currently? What would they like to see more of? What is some emerging technology that they don't feel like the students are learning before graduating? So all of this is valuable information that ABET receives that we are able to take into account as we're developing our criteria. Also, ABET program evaluators come from industry as well as academia. So our program evaluators are just not faculty, they're just not deans. They are also made up of industry individuals who are at companies doing the work that we're preparing our students to do. ABET delivers a large value to industry as well as them develop, give, providing much value to us. So it ensures the educational requirements to enter the profession are met. So industry can rest assured that ABET graduates have the requirements needed to go into an entry level position in the careers. This is because, they know this because we have this in the industry advisory council, also because we have members from industry who are represented as PEVs and also members of the member societies. And it's an op ABET brings together academia and industry in the same room to discuss the needs of the professionals of tomorrow. ABET is also faculty. Faculty plays a huge role in ABET. They help to, again, just like industry, establish our criteria. They are made up of our program evaluators. We also have an academic advisory council, just like the industrial um, advisory council, and they advise us on um, what are some of the challenges facing academia right now. In which ways could we make some of our processes work better within the academic environment? They also provide input on our criteria, um, and a large number of our program evaluators are from academia. ABET is also a global citizen. ABET has many partnerships around the world. One of the most significant partnerships is our mutual recognition agreements. So this is an international agreement among accrediting agencies to say that all of our graduates from any one of our programs have a subst substantial equivalency in their outcomes and in the skills obtained during their education to be able to enter the, the profession. They, to be part of a mutual recognition agreement, it's like being evaluated by ABET. So they bring a team of evaluators every six years. We have to fill out something uh, very similar to a self-study report. So there are people who evaluate how well ABET does what ABET does, just as we do when we go out to evaluate your, evaluate your program. So we practice what we preach in our participation with the mutual recognition agreements. Some examples of those agreements, the first one is the Washington Accord, and this is a mutual recognition agreement for engineering. So here is a list of all of the countries who participate in the Washington Accord and their accrediting bodies. We partner with them. We work together, we collaborate. There is no competition. Our main goal is quality education worldwide. It's very valuable partnerships that we have. We provide guidance, and in some cases, we seek guidance from our partners. Another example um, is the graduate attributes that the Washington Court has established. Every single one of us must prove that our graduates have these attributes upon graduation. So again, very similar to ABET's uh, accreditation processes. There's also the Sydney Accord, and I'll go through these kind of quickly. This is for engineering technology programs. 
So we're a member of the Washington Accord for Engineering. We're a member of the Sydney Accord for Engineering Technology Programs. And here's a list, again, of all the countries and the corresponding um, accreditation boards. There's also one for computing and IT, which is the Seoul Accord. And all of the accords I just mentioned are members of the International Engineering Alliance. The, National, the International Engineering Alliance also uh, accepts uh, individual memberships, school memberships, uh, other organizations. Um, and we are, ABET is a signatory of the International Engineering Alliance um, because of our participation in the Washington Accord, Sydney Accord, and the Dublin Accord. But we had to apply for this as well and be accepted to be able to have the honor of being a signatory in this esteemed group. So who recognizes ABET accreditation outside of the United States? Here is a list, the International Engineering Alliance that I just mentioned, the Seoul Accord. We also have memorandums of uh, understanding with 17 international organizations. So currently we go in uh, with our, our mutual, our memorandum of understanding, we go in and we help them improve their systems and their processes. And we all know that when you teach, you learn. So it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship. Even though we are helping them, we also learn a lot from the people that we have these understandings with. And we have them with over 17 international organizations currently. Also, there's other STEM education organizations that recognize ABET, um, the International Federation of Engineering Education Societies, the Global Engineering Deans Council, the World Federation of Engineering Organization, and UNESCO. So as you can see, we really are a global citizen. We are involved on many different levels globally with many different organizations and organizations that all share the same purpose as ABET. Most recently, we've become a United Nations Global Compact Partner. Because of ABET's deep affiliation with industry, we were accepted on the Global Compact as a participant. To be part of the Global Compact, you have to show that you support corporate sustainability and that you incorporate social responsibility into everything that you do. Because of ABET's encouragement um, with industry and our collaborations with industry and also through our graduates who are going to go into industry, we are able to show that we support on a significant level sustainable development and design practices. And you'll notice that is in ABET's criteria. We also um, just partnered with University World News. They're an online global higher education publication, which uh, provides news and documentary on higher education and research worldwide. So it's global. Um, they represent every single country on the planet pretty much at one point or another throughout the course of three years. And ABET has been very fortunate um, to be able to collaborate with them on many articles, um, many initiatives. We just recently wrote this article on embedding um, higher education sustainability practices into uh, the criteria. I put a QR code for the link um, if anyone would like to read this article. It's an excellent article. It really, really goes into the depth of who ABET is and why we do what we do. And it was a collaboration with ABET CEO, Dr. Michael Milligan. Give everybody an opportunity to get the QR code. And there'll be many, many more articles on University World News that ABET will be collaborating and in some cases actually writing. And they will all be focused on topics and higher education um, from a global standpoint. Next is ABET is altruistically innovative. So we're not innovative just to be innovative. We're innovative when we see a need in society that we can fill. So we're constantly seeking for ways to improve what we do, to make, uh, to streamline our processes, to provide a service where an emerging technology is rapidly taking over. We also encourage our programs to be as innovative as we are, if not more innovative than we are at ABET. And a lot of times, most of the times, they're more innovative than we are, our programs. 
and um, to show our encouragement and our support of innovation within our accredited programs, we established an ABET Innovation Award. Anyone uh, who is part of an ABET accredited program can apply for this award. Um, and you just have to show that you've embedded some innovative processes that impact the quality education of your students. Um, and if you are selected, you have to be nominated. There's a nominating committee. And if you are selected, you get the honor of being recognized as ABET's annual Innovation Award winner and you receive a $10,000 award as well to continue to do the great work that you started. And then here's just a little bit more about the Innovation Award. If you're interested to learn more about that, what's the criteria for winning? Um, we recognize the winners every fall. And if you, have a, if you are currently accredited or plan on being accredited, I highly recommend that you check into this award. Or if you know someone who has an ABET accredited program that's doing amazing, innovative things, maybe you want to nominate them for this award. Above and beyond our award, we're always looking at the future of higher education. And right now what we're noticing is a trend in universities offering certificate programs in highly technical fields. When we saw that, we noticed that there is currently no one offering quality assurance of these certificate programs, and they're popping up almost daily. So universities all over the world are creating certificate programs that they're either embedding in their degrees or offering um, as a resource for people in industry to come and, and brush up their skills, maybe get a new skill set. We had many, many people come to us and say, ABET needs to be out there recognizing the quality programs so that learners and so that employers can safely know where to send their students or their employees to take a certificate program. Parents want to know if they're sending their kids to a quality certificate program. They're just overwhelmed by the options and the newness of it all. So having someone say, this, this certificate program meets the outcomes that it says it does and the students are leaving with the knowledge it says they will is of great value to us. So in response to that, ABET created a steering committee to do the research. We've created criteria that we are going to pilot. We have a core team working on this pilot. Obviously the criteria is not as intensive as a degreed uh, we are not going to call it accreditation. It'll be a recognition of a certificate program, but they will have to prove that their students are obtaining the skills and the knowledge that they say that they are in the advertisement of these programs. We currently, uh, as part of our program, our pilot, we have one two-year institution, we have two four-year institutions, and then we have one institution with a graduate-level certificate. So we are we, we are piloting each one of um, the offerings, and as you can see, they're in line with what ABET currently accredits as well as far as two year, four year, and one year. If this goes well, ABET will probably be looking into accrediting, uh, recognizing, my bad, recognizing certificate programs that um, are not in connection with a two year, four year institution. And we've had some societies, professional societies that you just saw on the screen reach out to us and say, hey, well, ABET, will you come review our certificate programs and give it your recognition? And we've had some very large corporations asking us to do the same for the certificate programs that they um, offer. So there is potential for us to go outside of academia to offer our recognition of these programs, but we want to pilot and open it up to academia first. ABED is continuous quality improvement. As you all know, it's the foundation of what we've been founded on, whether we're recognizing a certificate, accrediting a program, looking at our own practices internally. We are always, always, always looking to improve, to be more innovative, and to be able to offer a better service to society. And then just, you know, here's a couple of the quality um, continuous improvement processes. Um, that is part of ABET's um, everything that we are, our criteria, our processes, our policies, and there's just a, a bulleted list there on the screen for you to see of some of the key 
key things that we really look for and key things that we've embedded into our quality and continuous quality improvement processes. Again, I, I spoke about quality, continuous quality improvement, the importance of assessing student learning outcomes. A lot of our programs, new programs, uh, have a lot of questions about how to develop an assessment of student learning outcomes program within their institution. I'm gonna talk more about the resources that we offer, why it's so important, why you need to know what your students are learning in order for you to get better. You need to be able to address the needs of your students and the only way to know what they are is to have an assessment practice in place. And then again, we are our graduates. We are all here because we care about the students, because we care about them being able to obtain the skills that they have, to go out there and do what they're passionate about, and to be able to be out there helping to make a world a better place, helping to solve the complex problems that we all face as a society. They are going to tackle such things as poverty. They are going to be in a world that is, where technology is increasing at a rate like we've never seen before. They are going to be tackling climate, climate issues, increasing storms, increasing disasters from climate change. They are going to need to work in a diverse environment and they're going to need to be respectful of the diversity and they're going to need to know that innovation comes from diversity because the world is getting smaller every day. They're going to need to address food insecurity, which is happening on a global scale right now. And they're going to need to dream big. And again, that's why all of these and many, many more issues, complex problems, solutions they're going to have to come up with they need to have a quality education that's built on a technical skills foundation as well as an ethical, as well as respect for sustainable design, as well as being able to work on innovative and diverse teams. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic over to my uh, colleague, Jane Emmett, who is going to discuss um, in more detail ABET's processes. Hi, everybody. OK, now I have to top that. <laughs> Just so I have a sense, I'm going to be talking about the value of ABET accreditation. And I'm going to get into some specifics, but not too much, because otherwise we'd be here for like three or four days, yeah? So I wanted to get a sense of who in the room already is pretty familiar. You, ha you have an ABET accredited program, you've been through the process, you have some familiarization with it that's pretty high level. Could you just raise your hand so I can kind of, okay, Umberto, I see that, yeah, okay, good. And if you have a little bit, you've been investigating it, you've been exploring it, it's like a thought, you know, so you're doing your research, you don't know as much as you'd like to, but you know something, could you raise your hand? Okay, great, and then nothing, tell me. What is this mystery? Oh, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but that, that's mean. But um, I have a commitment, the same as Jessica's. I mean, she spoke about ABET writ large, all the very many things that we do. I'm going to focus in on accreditation. But I do have a commitment that for those of you that don't know much about it or are starting to consider it, that you get excited about the possibility out of what you hear today and the value that ABET accreditation can provide for your graduates, for your programs, and for your institutions. The other thing that I'm committed to is that you walk away today with the sense of, you can do this. My suspicion is your programs already incorporate so much of the standards that ABET espouses that it's more a matter of understanding the process and learning how to tell your story. So value of ABET accreditation, we accredit programs, right? We don't accredit institutions. We don't accredit graduates. We're forward thinking. We're purpose driven at the programmatic level. I'd say our core purpose in everything we do is about assuring confidence. Confidence for the students, the parents, industry, confidence for society, 
we're committed that when students enter the workforce, they're ready. And the eye is always on where Jessica left off, okay? So this is all a means for creating a world that is safer, it's more efficient, it's more comfortable, and it's more sustainable. And as each month passes, the challenges get bigger, and the world needs more amazing engineers and computer scientists and applied scientists and engineering technologists equipped to handle it. We, we are running, we need that now. And this is what we're all working on. That's why we're here at this conference. So we've talked a lot about the value for the students. You know, they have a credential. They've graduated from an ABET accredited program. It's recognized internationally. It has global currency. They know that they're in a program where the program and the institution is committed to them fulfilling the outcomes and being ready to join the workforce. For the faculty, while sometimes people think, oh, this is more work for the faculty if we go for a better accreditation, but part of what is important for programs is that faculty have the say over the curriculum and, and, and working on continuous improvement, that they have the resources available to them and their programs, that the institution is supporting that. That is a key piece of what our criteria measures. And that translates into facilities and training and professional opportunities. There's benefit for faculty to really own and shape the program. And of course, for institutions, it's international recognition, it's a third party saying, peer review, there's prestige, again, global currency. Society, I already said that part, right? You, the world needs engineers and computer scientists and everything else. So let's focus a little bit on where ABET is right now in 90 years or so of being in existence. So. I'm, these numbers are of, as of October 1, 2022, we only update our numbers once a year. And it's not October 1st yet, so I don't have those numbers for you, okay? But uh, we just finished an accreditation cycle. We accredited many new programs. We re-accredited. And as you can see, international programs are 25% and growing of all ABET accredited programs. Um, so that is quite substantial, and we keep expanding all the time. Another way to look at our numbers, you can see each year we increase. So 203 new programs, 46 additional institutions. And again, we're, we're growing outside the U.S. globally all the time because we come to conferences like this, right? By the way... There's information you'll hear from Jessica and me today, and this afternoon we've got a Q&A, but the best way to find out about ABET accreditation processes and criteria is to come volunteer with us as a program evaluator. You get to learn all about it from the inside, you understand the processes, and you become a valued resource to your institution. You can talk to me afterwards about that. So let's get into accreditation a little bit more closely. What programs does ABET accredit? Today, I'm mostly going to be referencing engineering because I'm at an engineering conference. But ABET has four separate commissions, four different areas where we accredit STEM. So we have applied and natural science. And so programs like industrial hygiene, safety programs, quality management, we've now incorporated natural sciences. So we accredit biology programs or chemistry programs. This year, uh, uh, actuarial finance program, mathematics. So we're expanding into a whole new territory there. Computing, so computer science. That's the predominant, but now, every year, more and more cybersecurity programs seeking a better accreditation, information systems, information technology, 
And then, of course, engineering, and the, we add. You'll see later in my presentation, we develop new criteria as new areas of engineering become important. Just in the past two years, we started doing, this is not engineering, but data science, right? Because that became a very relevant in the applied science space as well as in the computing space. So new, new disciplines and expertise, you know, requiring quality programs every year. And then engineering technology, so programs that also accredit uh, at the two-year level, associates, as well as at the four-year level. So, and those would be in the practition of engineering technology. You've heard it said now a few times, the, the philosophy of ABET is outcomes. We don't measure what you put into the program. We measure what the, you measure, actually we don't, but you tell us how you do it what the students are taking out of the program so that when they walk in day one of their new job, they're walking in with the skills, knowledge, and capability to make a contribution that first year. And then the commitment to continuous improvement. So processes for doing that self-evaluation and having that automated as a mechanism and available. That's the heart and maybe the hardest thing when a new program is coming to get accredited, but once you get it started, it is uh, the engine that shows you how to keep improving. A couple of principles about our programmatic accreditation, it's voluntary, nobody needs it. You don't need it for funding. We're non-governmental, uh, so it's not a gateway to any kind of funds like this. It's fair, it's impartial, it's peer review, and it requires the program to do self-assessment, which we know is such a powerful tool for discovering gaps and places where you want to improve. It's holistic. So as we go through, it's not just the technical content or the curriculum or even faculty qualifications. There's a holistic view of the whole program, and you have to meet it all. And even if you have the best teachers on the planet or the best laboratory facilities, if you don't have processes that are validating and assure consistency, that could be cause uh, for not to be accredited. That's the last time I'll talk about not being accredited because I want you to know you can do this. So to be eligible for ABET accreditation, you have to have at least one graduate who's gone through the whole curriculum. So that makes sense, the whole program. And um, you have to have, uh, you have to be recognized as an institution that can confer a degree, yeah? So usually outside the US, it's the Ministry of Education recognizes you can confer baccalaureate, associate degrees, the whatever the name of your degrees are. Um, and I, not on this slide, but I would also say, because Jess touched on it, you know, we have partners with accrediting organizations in so many countries, and we only go where we're welcome. So we always reach out to the local accrediting organization so that they can bless our coming, and we invite them to come and participate as observers on the visit. Oftentimes they come to our training, but we're very aware of that um, symbiotic relationship, not a competition. So we ask that they uh, say it is okay for us to do the accreditation of your program. Now, this is where I could talk for like a week, but I won't. We're gonna get into the documents that guide the accreditation, right? This is like the constitution. These are the, the, the sacred documents. First is our ABET criteria. And ABET criteria for the different STEM disciplines do are different. So computing accreditation has its general criteria, applied science, engineering. And that criteria is gonna talk about how the program is managed, how you're validating that your students are completing all requirements, for example. It's gonna, uh, talk about assessment, that you have that ongoing process, obviously the curriculum, and if you're a specialized program like civil engineering, do you have the requirements for that in the curriculum? 
And so important, the resources and support that your institution is providing you so you can do the, the work that you need to do. We also have our accreditation policy and procedure manual. That is not just for me as running ABET staff, that is for you too, because it talks about how the eligibility for accreditation, how our reviews are conducted, um, how you share with the world that you've achieved ABET accreditation, uh, appeals. I said I was gonna talk about not to accredits, but there's an appeal process that's built into this. Those are our governing documents. So when you're considering, um, let me just, before I go to that, when you're considering ABET accredit, that's where you go first. Read the criteria. Get familiar with what you would be asked to comply with. Another thing that is often misunderstood, so I wanna touch on it, is the importance of the program name. Because it sounds so kind of nitpicky, or like bean counting, but the program name is your representation of your program to the world. And once accredited, that name is going to be on the ABET public program list. So it's important that you represent your program name accurately, that it represents the, the discipline of the program and what your students are going to be engaged with. It actually tells ABET, is this an engineering program? Is this a computing program? Is this an applied science? So we can make sure the right people and the right criteria, or the right experts are looking at your program. And then what program evaluators do we send, right? Because we want to send computer scientists to a computer science program. So that's how we sort all that out. If you have a specific discipline in your program name, you will need to uh, comply with our general criteria, but you will also have to meet specific program criteria. A civil engineering program is going to have different curriculum requirements from mechanical. So that name also will say what program criteria you need to comply with. So I'm going to talk briefly about the criteria. Um, because each aspect it is an opportunity to cause an amazing improvement and continuation of developing the effectiveness of your program. Your students, you know, that's where you talk about, you know, what's the criteria for new students or transfer students? Uh, what's the advising processes? Very important. Program educational objectives. I mean, that is your communication to the world of what makes your program unique and what unique value are your graduates providing? What will they be doing? What will they be working on? And because we are all about getting input, this is where many programs use in industry advisory boards. The future employers having a say about what those objectives are. And, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. It, it, you know, technology and needs change so quickly. So part of what ABET asks is that you review those regularly because they may be changing. Challenges arise, new technology, new industry in your area. And that may mean changes and updates to your program educational objectives. Student outcomes. Right? Focusing, we have seven of them for ABET, and when you read the student outcomes, you see the full breadth. Everything from fundamental uh, skills for an engineer to be effective, to teamwork and communication, and awareness of ethical, global concerns, societal concerns. All of that is in the student outcomes, which, you know, you touch on through that whole view of the full four or five years of your program. Uh, continuous improvement, we talked about that. Curriculum, I don't think I need to say more about that, right? And faculty, it's not, <laughs> I often get asked, how many faculty do we need to meet the criteria? Well, that's up to you, right? Because you know your program, but you make your case for having a sufficient amount of faculty with the right qualifications, not only to deliver the curriculum, but also 
to handle everything that a program requires, contact with the students, professional develop, training opportunities, and you make your case that you have sufficient strength there to carry on the program, not only today, but looking into the future. Facilities, everything from laboratories to classroom space, is it, is it an environment, is it a safe environment, is it an environment where students can fulfill on those outcomes and institution support. Program criteria, again, that gets discipline level. If you want to read more about the criteria, you go to our website, so there's our link, and uh, you'll see all kinds of resources on the website, but right smack in the middle is about ABET accreditation. The key page, the key resource on our website for ABIT accreditation is accreditation criteria and supporting documents. So that's where you'll see the latest criteria. You will also see what's being planned for the future because we update, we upgrade, we provide new criteria. But every year, December 1, we publish the criteria for the coming year. So for this December 1, We'll be doing 2024 25. If you go today, you will see the criteria. It doesn't change that much. We're not out to make things difficult, right? But we, are, we do improve, so you pay attention to that. I just picked criteria for accrediting engineering programs. So you click on that link, you open it up, you can see the beginning of I've got one, two, three, and I ran out of space. <laughs> But that's where you'll see the general criteria. Every program must meet the general. And then further down, depending on the name of your program, you may have to meet program criteria. Program criteria will only be additive for curriculum. That makes sense, right? And for faculty. So there may be some things, again, it is the professional society with input from academia and other stakeholders design the program criteria. What needs to be in there to have that graduate be successful in that specific field of engineering? Okay, so I'm trying to make this, um, let me just think here. My commitment is that you go, yeah, we can do this. Now, I feel like I'm giving you so much information, it could be like, uh. But here's the process. So one of the key things is creating that self-study, that self-assessment. That's probably the hardest piece when you're in your review year. But you're telling your story with evidence as to how you say you meet the criteria. Then. There's going to be a team of colleagues, the program evaluators, that come from the discipline appropriate for your program. And they're going to be reviewing that self-study, which will guide them on what information, questions they have, and then what they want to see when they come to your campus. And we are all so happy we get to go back to campuses now that the pandemic, because that was not fun. So we are back visiting the campuses again. And what they see in the self-study and engaging with you will tell them who they want to interview, what they want to look at when they come to your campus. And again, the program evaluators are the ones that do that. The timeline. Accreditation is a minimum 18 months. The whole process, 18 months. And if it's your first time having an accredited program at ABET or in a commission where you don't already have accredited programs, then you will be required to go through a readiness review. This is good news because the readiness review is not evaluative. It doesn't lead to accreditation result or even feed into it, but it gives you an opportunity to know, do I understand this process sufficiently? And we will give you feedback to be successful. And for ABET, you know, we want you to be successful. I think there was a period of time where a lot of programs would come in and they were clearly not ready. 
And they put all this work into it, but they didn't fully understand. So they missed the mark. That shouldn't have to happen, right? So the readiness review takes place, you're, you do like a, a mini self-study, just focusing on some key things that would show that you understand the process and have you engage in it, right? When you do it, you understand it at much different level than if you're just reading about it. That happens in October, then we tell you, submit, you're ready, maybe you should postpone, you have a couple of issues, or I think the issues are enough that maybe another year would be good. If you're ready to go, you will let us know in January by filling, it's a form, it's nothing that's substantive other than your official request for your program to be reviewed. That way, we can start to get to work, compile the team, start to put everything together. Meanwhile, you're working on your self-study. And the self-study is due to ABET in July. Then, the team comes. October, usually, September, October, November. They will give you your first uh, review of anything that they see before they leave campus. So if there's any shortcomings or gaps, you can get to work right away. A few months later, you'll get a formal draft statement, making it very clear. Again, if there are things that are missing, you have time. So the visit is just a snapshot. And many things that looked, you know, back at the, the day of the visit, gets worked out in the process. And that's so key, because while I know having an ABET accredited program is very important, I also know equally, if not more important, going through that process means you're building strength in your program, and you're setting up systems to ensure that continues in the future. The following July, a year after you've submitted your self-study, the commissions come together, they vote. You get your accreditation action, and you'll get your final statement documenting uh, the findings, including maybe there are none. You cleared it completely. And then you will be accredited. So wait, before I do that, you get accredited maximum six years. And then you have to be generally reviewed again. Sometimes you may have to do reports in interims if you're working on some shortcomings, but you never get more than six years, which makes sense, right? Because it's ongoing and you're building systems uh, that continue the improvement into the future. And if I didn't mention it, the best way to find out about ABET accreditation and our processes is to become a PEV. So if you're interested, make sure you talk to me. Okay, so that was a lot about um, the criteria and the process, and maybe it stimulated more questions. We all have opportunities for that in the panel later this afternoon. I'm going to just touch briefly so that I stop talking and we open it up for a few questions, that along with the accrediting of programs, right, close to, mm, I don't know, we do about 700 programs a year and close to 300 institutions. There's other initiatives at ABET that are designed to strengthen the accreditation process that's outside of the reviews itself. Diversity, equity, inclusion is something we have been working on for some time and really starting to take some ground. You know, the science is clear that diversity uh, creates better results, better outcomes when you have Students that can work with diverse teams, when you welcome that, when you embrace that, when you bring that into your programs, your organizations. So this is something um, that is near to dear and dear to ABET's heart. And we're going to continue to do that, not only by uh, uh, integrating it into our criteria, but also into our practices as an organization. So every commission has some... Uh, has uh, floated, uh, created some language for their criteria that represents the principles of DEI. And we're working on one that will cross all four commissions. 
and uh, we're integrating uh, new definitions, accessibility is new this year, making sure all students have access to successfully complete a program. And we're integrating the principles into our own ABEC code of conduct and into our own competency models that we hold the program evaluators and the team chairs, the commissioners that do the evaluation, hold them to account for that. I am not going to read the definitions. They are on our website. But it's important that when we talk about it, people know what we mean when we say inclusion, diversity, equity, and recently added accessibility. Um, I think we'll be adding, in short term, one on respectful environment. So everybody's like, what does that mean? Well, we have to get a clear definition. For EAC this year, very exciting, we decided to do a pilot for DEI, taking principles of DEI to incorporate into our curriculum, specific, uh, into our criteria, specifically Criterion 5, curriculum, and Criterion 6, faculty. And, um, so we made that available to every institution that had to review this, this cycle, 23-24, and uh, over 30 institutions says, we'll, we'll play, we'll do it. It's, it's a pilot, so it's not going to have any impact on the accreditation results for them. But um, it's an opportunity for them to express, because a lot of these institutions are proud of the work that they're doing, and it gives them a place to represent that. Um, and we'll be collecting data from 156 institutions um, because we're still learning. You know, what does that look like? We, none of this DEI is uh, quantitative. We don't say you need this much of this or that much of this. Um, and you'll see when I show you the, the pilot criteria. Um, we also have a range of institutions, small, larger, and then internationally, we have Chile, Ecuador participating, Spain, and Saudi Arabia. So that is designed to really give us, you know, what do they think of when they see this? How do they say they're providing this for their faculty and in the curriculum? So this is the EAC Criterion 5 curriculum. This is what has been there for some time, right? Your semester credit hours in math and engineering topics, broad education component, and then in red is what we're using in the pilot. Content that assures awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion for professional practice consistent with the, uh, the institution's mission. Very important. We accredit so many different types of institutions all over the world, very diverse communities, faith-based schools. Um, I was talking with somebody, Saudi Arabia, they have you know, gender, they have a male college, a female college. What do they think of when they start to look at how are they representing diversity, equity, inclusion? It's not gonna be the same for everyone. So it has to be consistent with the institution mission. And then the other place that we'll be um, collecting information is in faculty. Again, the addition for the pilot is in uh, Criterion 6, and that's demonstrate that your faculty also have knowledge of applicable institution policies. They're tapped into that. They think from that. They demonstrate awareness appropriate to providing an equitable and inclusive environment that respects the institution's mission. So it's a learning year for us, and we'll be taking that data and putting together a report, sharing it with the institutions who participated, and I think that will guide what the actual language might be when it comes time to revising that. It's a two-year pilot. This is just the end of the faculty criteria. And then lastly, I spoke um, about criteria changes. It takes like two years at ABET to make a change in the criteria. You get a lot of heads up. So it posted, this is coming. 
So once you have gotten accreditation, you want to keep your eye on that for, again, nothing radical. And if it's too radical, we'll be, make a big deal out of it because we don't want anybody surprised. So they're improving the masters, uh, standalone and integrated masters. We did work implemented uh, changes for construction engineering. And then this past year, some changes were out for public review and comment, which is part of the process, right? So we don't just have the societies who write the criteria, but stakeholders in academia, in industry, have a chance to review it, comment, and that can be integrated in, in the criteria that ultimately gets developed. So this past year, we've had civil criteria for a long time, obviously, but the ASCE looking to improve um, have done a revision that's been out for public review and comment and then brand new never we never have this before is program criteria for mechatronics and robotics so that's a, a collaboration with ASME and IEEE and that's been out so it could be at the end of October when we have our governance meeting they will vote to implement this and so there will be new criteria for mechatronics and robotics, and then revisions to the already existing criteria. And if all goes well at the governance meetings, we may have ecological engineering program criteria out for public review. So that'll be a whole new area for ABAT. And engineering management we have, uh, but they have done some work to make sure that it's current and relevant. And so that'll be out for public, probably, I can never say for sure because they have to vote on these things, and you know, you, you don't want to predict. But that's what's in the pipeline. Other things we do is we really do, I know this may be hard to believe, but look to make it easier for programs. How to make the self-study process easier. Um, we work with the Academic Advisory Council, and they've given us so much feedback for how to streamline it so it's less work to put together that document how to present your materials, best practices for ABET. So you have some guidance and an idea. I know when programs are up for accreditation, it's like you want to get it right, you want to get it right. And so we want that transparency and support. Um, you know, we, we continue. I think the most important thing that I love about what happened these past two years was after the pandemic, and we used to have institutional rep day uh, in Baltimore, everybody had to fly to Baltimore, so it's expensive, and cram-packed for a day to meet your team chair. Now we do webinars, and you know, attendance has like tripled, more people can participate, and we can focus, because we can do an hour and a half on how to write an excellent self-study, or how to do reports, or how to prepare for the logistics, and each year, those get created, and then there, you today can go on the website, uh, accreditation criteria and supporting documents, and you can see this year's. It's open to the public. You'll see the recording, you look at the slides, another way to understand our processes. And with that big breath, I'm gonna turn this back over to Jess. So Jane just went through a lot of information, valuable information, very valuable, um, on the specifics of becoming ABET accredited, the process, a little bit about our criteria. I think she emphasized at the end how committed we are to continuous improvement, that we put ourselves through it continuously every single day of every hour. ABET's looking for ways to improve. And she shared that great list of what we've been up to um, for the past year or so. So... It can seem daunting to hear all of that all at once. I can guarantee you that if you looked at our criteria, looked at your program, you're already doing most of it. You just don't realize it. When you first look at the criteria, it's a lot. It's a lot. You take it piece by piece and look at it, and then go back to what you're doing. I'm sure you can find examples of ways you're already fitting most of our criteria. As I said, in going through that process that new programs go through, a lot of times, a lot of the fear comes from the assessment, creating an assessment process if you don't already have one. 
Or if you have a new assessment process, sometimes they're concerned, will it be good enough? You know, am I, am I doing, you know, dotting all my I's and crossing all my T's and doing what ABET wants to see? What we want to see is that the process is yours. That's what we want to see. We want to see that you're achieving the student outcomes in a way that fits your program and your institution and your resources. So all you have to show us is that you're achieving the student outcomes, you're collecting data, and you're using that data to make improvements where necessary. We won't tell you how to do it. We want it to be yours. And that creates some stress for people. They want us to come in and say, just tell me how to do it, Abet. No, 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 it's got to be yours, because it's got to be yours, you'll own it, you'll sustain it, and it will work for you. But that being said, we don't leave you out alone on your own. We offer you resources. We try to give you best practices that you can then take back to your campus in implementing your continuous improvement processes. So we've created an assessment resource page. I'm gonna go into some of the specifics of what this page offers. But we have a lot of free resources out here. So whether you're currently accredited, whether you're seeking accreditation within the next year or two, or whether you're just learning about ABET for the first time today, I recommend that you take a look at these resources. Because whether you go for ABET accreditation or not, there, I believe you will find some value in what you're going to learn and read that you can take back to your programs. Again, all we're concerned about is that around the world, higher education, the quality of that, and the confidence in the graduates coming out of your program. So I invite you to use our resources, whether you're going to become a part of the ABET ecosystem or not through getting programmatic accreditation. So this is, a, I like my QR codes. There's going to be a lot of them in these last couple slides. I hope it makes it easy for you to access the information. Um, this is a direct link to that page I just showed you. That's going to have all of the resources that I'm going to go through right now. Get the code. Okay. If I progress too quickly and you can't get it, you can come see me afterwards. I'll be happy to, to direct you uh, where to go to get any of these resources. So one of the things you'll find on this page is on-demand webinars. Our assessment experts took the time to record short webinars. Some are five minutes long, some are close to 20 minutes long. It depends on the topic, depends on the information that the expert wanted to deliver. These are free. You can go on, you can watch them as many times as you want. Um, you know, you can take notes, you can, you can even reach out to education at abet.org if you have any questions about what you saw. We also have 15 articles that are based upon assessment, different aspects of program assessment, different aspects of student learning outcomes. Uh, it's filled with best practices, um, some examples. Um, I believe if you were to go on and look at some of those articles, you would definitely recognize some of the names of the individuals who wrote those articles. They are world-renowned experts in assessment. We also offer assessment programs. Now these are not part of our free resources. These are going to be paid registrations, educational opportunities to attend either virtually or in person to one of our assessment best practices workshops. They range from one day to four days long. One day workshops will be things like the fundamentals of program assessment. Um, once you've taken fundamentals and you've put some stuff into practice, we have an advanced workshop that will teach more advanced skills in program assessment. We have many, many people who come back and do the advanced after taking the fundamentals, putting some practices in the work, works, and then realizing that there's not, that's not all there is and that there's more they can learn about program assessment. Oh, oh. Let me go back <laughs> um, uh, before I share that. We offer um, a four-day workshop, which is ideal. Um, and out of ideal, 
Graduates become ideal scholars. They not only learn the fundamentals of program assessment, they learn some advanced topics. They learn how to be assessment champions and leaders at their program. So in attendance for IDEAL, we will have faculty, we've had deans, we've had um, employees whose main job on a campus was assessment. They build, uh, they work with the faculty to build and maintain the assessment practices. We've had people from other accrediting bodies come and take IDEAL. Um, people from around the world. So um, this isn't only built for program faculty, but we hope that whoever's in attendance will incorporate their faculty into their assessment processes because faculty is key and they must be part of the assessment processes. I believe we have someone from Cartagena who just graduated from IDEAL. Is Monica here? Yay, so Monica is a recent IDEAL uh, scholar. Um, so she's, she's now part of a, a great network of assessment professionals. Um, uh, she took four days uh, intensive and then, she, you know, at the end um, had the skills and abilities to be able to now take that on the, her campus and lead their assessment process or help to lead their assessment process. So congratulations on that. <laughs> we also offer um, continuous improvement assessment forum where you can bring teams from your university. So we want you to bring at least two people from your program or university. You bring your own materials. This is the first time we've ever done this. So you bring your own materials. You learn from the experts. So you'll learn best assessment practices from the experts. And then you do peer-to-peer -peer sharing with people from around the world who are at that continuous improvement assessment forum. You share what you're doing. You talk about what you're doing, what works, what hasn't worked. Our program assessment experts will come around the room and listen to your conversations. And they may say, hey, did you consider this? Did you consider that? They will not consult. They will not look at your papers and tell you what you need to do to, to uh, make them better. They again, we want it to be yours, but they will help guide your thinking and guide your conversations with your peers so that you can get the most out of the experience. We have many, many more offerings. Um, I don't have time to go through all of, all of them, um, but there's some of our staple um, products that we offer and the services that we provide to faculty and other professionals so that you can not only meet the criteria that ABET sets to become accredited, but also just you can improve your programs. Our flagship event is our annual symposium. The symposium in and of itself is all about two days. A little sh the second day is a little shorter than a full day. But it is basically, I'm just going to say, it's two days of sessions led by your peers, led by experts in their fields. Um, there will be topics on accreditation, uh, uh, what Jane just presented to you, and, and many other topics in relation to accreditation. Assessment topics are discussed. Um, by the experts and by your peers. You can find out what your peers are doing. We have topics on diversity, equity, inclusion, what everyone's doing um, to increase that awareness within their programs and their schools. There's some industry folks there that will do presentations as well um, on sustainable practices. And we have a theme every year. And this year's theme, I think, is, is pretty exciting. So science fiction, the science fact is our theme. And it's all going to be based on the impact of artificial intelligence on higher education. So I know everyone's chat GBT, right? That's just the bottom. That's just the surface of what we're, of what we're gonna discuss on the impact of AI on education. We just put out a request for proposals. So if anyone has any topics, anything that they wanna share, whether it's AI in relation to higher education, whether it's accreditation, what's your journey? Where, you know, uh, if you want to share your journey, uh, whether it's assessment, do you, you're doing something really neat with your assessment practices that you think others could benefit from learning. Um, and anything at all. You want to talk about sustainable design project that you've had. Maybe you want to talk about some diversity initiatives. I encourage you to go onto our website and submit uh, a request um, to speak. It will be reviewed. And then if you're selected, we'll invite you to come to our symposium um, that's happening April 4th through the 5th in Tampa, Florida. Jane snuck this in here. Yeah, how'd that get in my presentation, Jane? <laughs> so, uh, as Jane says, 
If you want to learn more about AVET, the best way to become uh, to learn more is to become a program evaluator. I agree with her 100% on that. But there's other ways to get involved with ABET's ecosystem as well. If becoming a program evaluator isn't for you or it's not time yet uh, for you to become a program evaluator, um, again, you can anytime you attend one of our workshops, you attend our symposium, uh, you reach out to us via email with questions, you submit a readiness review, whatever you do, the second you make contact with us, just be in here today listening to our presentation, you are part of ABET. Um, you are part of our ecosystem. Um, we're all in this together um, to ensure that our graduates of the future are prepared, are ready, and that society has the confidence in them that they're going to be able to address the complex issues that we're all facing. I thank you. I was so proud of that slide, too, and I forgot about it. Okay, so thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jessica, for this wonderful presentation. Un pequeño mensaje para la audiencia. Eh, bueno, eh, sé que ahora vamos a tener una sesión de un panel de discusión alrededor de algunas preguntas relacionadas con la temática que acabamos de escuchar. Pero esta tarde hemos reservado un espacio en el Salón 303A a las 3 de la tarde para que Cualquiera de ustedes que ha atendido esta sesión o cualquier otra persona interesada llegue a este salón y nos va a encontrar a todos nosotros para hacer las preguntas que esté interesado en cualquiera que sean las temáticas, ya sea que esté interesado en la acreditación, ya sea que esté en un programa acreditado, ya sea que esté interesado un poco sobre los recursos que IBET ofrece. Entonces vamos a estar en, en este salón, les repito, es el salón 303A a las 3 de la tarde, Eh, para poder escuchar todas sus eh, inquietudes, preguntas y tener un rato de discusión y conversación. Por otro lado, la organización me ha pedido que si alguien tiene alguna dificultad o alguna pregunta con la traducción simultánea, simplemente puede alzar la mano y acercarse a la... A, alguien se acercará de parte del staff a ayudarles con eso. Ok, so we are going to continue with our session. So we have now a panel discussion uh, to discuss some topics related with the presentation that we just have the chance to, to see from Jessica and Jane. Uh, this panel discussion will have the name Value of Aver Accreditation, Commitment to Quality and Education. So we will uh, welcome to the stage to Jessica, CFO and CEO for Abit. But also we have the participation from Angelica Burbano, Department Chair from the Industrial and Sustainability Department from ISESI, and she's Program Evaluator uh, from the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineering, IISE, representing this professional society for ABET. Angelica, welcome, thank you. And we have Maria Gabriela Calle, faculty at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the Universidad del Norte. She is also a Program Evaluator from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, representing IEEE for ABET in program accreditations review. Muchas gracias. Okay, so thank you very much for being here. So, Jessica, excellent presentation. I think we have the, all the glimpses and information about AVID and also the perspective from Jane from the details related to the accreditation process. So now we're gonna have a, a discussion, just a conversation around the topics that we just have the chance to listen from the, from the presentations. Um, of course, you know, the, the, the main topic, um, which also provides the name for the panel discussion, is the value of favorite accreditation. So we all know that, yeah, there's a process to get accredited, 
But during that process, programs also are exposed to very transformative experiences, innovations, and also add values for the programs. One of the things is like down the road, we get these early achievements, these early milestones that really transforms the program, right? So what we're gonna have is just some topics, some discussions about certain aspects of these values. And I would like to start, I'm, I feel free to jump in the conversation, any of you, I think that we have enough mics here uh, for that. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit um, about confidence and confidence in terms of the academic programs, MED standards, essential to prepare graduates to enter the STEM fields in the global workforce. Um, uh, Jessica, you just mentioned about the, you know, the influence and link and perspective from the engineering graduate attributes and how ABIT also, in addition to the professional society, that inputs that also defines part of the uh, ABIT criteria. So um, this question is related mostly in terms of the fundamentals or the foundations in terms of skills, competencies that distinguish graduates from ABIT accredited programs. So we would like to get your vision about those fundamental skills or competencies that you really know, okay, this is what a really transformation of the program in terms of the student and how the stu what the students achieve from a, a, an ABIT accredited program. So feel free to jump in. I can start. Okay. Thanks, Humberto. Uh, well, the first thing, I, I don't know what we, we didn't go through, but the different, uh, like, student outcomes. But as we, you, you were here yesterday, uh, we all heard about, you know, problem solving, you know, is there. We're problem solvers, and it's student outcome one. And, and I could go through, you know, the seven student outcomes, but um, they go around that. You know, we, we measure the impact of the solutions that we design. We have to communicate you know, probably what we do. Uh, we have to work in teams, uh, which is essential. And, and that's the key, uh, I guess, uh, as those are the key aspects that distinguish, you know, these uh, EBIT graduates. And they go along, you know, uh, with what we have as, you know, in our institution, you know, our uh, project educational objective. But, you know, EBIT gives us that framework, you know, that so we could just orient and shape what we do and, and you know, as we heard before, uh, very close with industry, but I know we will go to that, you know, later. But yeah, that's what I have to say, thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that the assessment process that, uh, that we have to implement for get accredited with AVID helps to, helps professors to actually make a systemic uh, approach to evaluate the students, and that helps them to improve the training and the education that they provide. So I think one of the greatest values that assessment, uh, that an ABET accreditation provides is that gets you a culture of continuous improvement in your organization, and that permeates different activities in academia, and it permeates the, the way we teach and the way our students uh, acquire all the all the skills that they require. Yeah, and that definitely has a tremendous impact in the prestige also, right, of the program and the institution. So Jessica, what's your, your visions on that? And just to add to, what, yeah. to what's already been said in, uh, you know, criteria three for ABET, which is our student outcomes, there's a portion of that that says that graduates will be able to recognize ethical, and um, uh, different professional responsibilities in their decision making, in the design, in the engineering designs. And I think ABET's criteria is rich with technical expertise for every single program that has program specific criteria. But I think it's criteria like that that's stated in our student outcomes that really set us apart. Um, because not only do we want them to have the technical skills, we want them to know how to use them and then be able to put those skills in different contexts. And I think that that's achieved uh, very specifically in, I think, uh, it's criteria three, number four, but then there's also, I think, criteria five, where it states, you know, again, they have to be able to work in teams and collaborate and, and do all of that. And I really think that that's really what, what sets us apart. 
Yeah, and, and I think that most of the things around all of those that you mentioned are what we call student experiences, right? So definitely that has a tremendous impact in the experience of the student. Actually, uh, you know, the uh, student's degree is for them, well, the, the largest investment that they do in life, but also what it has the really impact in their future. So in terms of student experiences, uh, what do you think it will be a very significant experience probably related to the ABA criteria as part of this transformative process during that? Yeah. Well, it didn't, we didn't plan it in order, but yeah, we'll go. Go, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, a significant experience is, you know, you could have heard about it like, you know, a capstone project, but this this final culminating design experience is, you know, revealing for us as faculty and also for our students because they get to apply why, what they learn through the program. Uh, yeah, keeping in mind, you know, standards from the profession and all the tools and all the constraints, but, you know, it's, it's really uh, revealing, you know, as faculty when you start seeing your, your program and, and somehow you have to see that uh, you have to transform the program or open, you know, space for that because it's just not, you know, classes and content. It's what you do with that. You know, you have to apply it. So through ABIT, you have that opportunity to reflect on your program and to have that experience. So for me, that's, that's what's important. Well, I think that uh, obviously capstone design is a main point in, in the programs, but also the, the other skills that students must learn and must practice throughout the curriculum to get a well-rounded education, such as communication skills, uh, so they are able to transmit all that they have learned and the way their projects work and the, the ability to, to continue learning throughout their lives. Those are very valuable uh, skills and things that they have to learn in practice. I love the place I'm at in this discussion because I get to build on uh, support what you are hearing from your faculty peers who have uh, implemented this at their programs. Um, I agree with everything that they said and, you know, under our Criterion 5 and the, the capstone, it's a culminating design, engineering design project that allows the students to apply everything that they've learned and that's the technical skills, the communication skills, the you know, being responsible global citizens. And um, I, I think that that really is a beneficial um, and probably one of the most valuable courses um, because it allows them to address real world situations and practice the application of the, all of the skills that they've learned in their education. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the experiences, one of the things that you mentioned in Commons are those that are supported by the SOs, right? In terms of all the experiences and I mean the capstone design, I mean the communication. So I heard from programs that they say, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, just having um, the, the teamwork, uh, student outcome, you know, that changed the way that how I work with the students from uh, uh, cooperative teams to collaborative teams, you know, so, so it's, not, it's not the same. And actually, how um, the the sense of um, the ethical aspects and the responsibility of the profession, also those experiences that impact uh, the way that you develop the curriculum. Uh, when you were talking about capstone, you mentioned constraints as part of the design process. One of the myths that I hear is like, oh, but the the criteria constraint, you know, the, the way that you do things, which is totally the opposite, right? I mean, it promotes innovation. You just mentioned about the ABED Innovation Award, right? So, so in terms of innovation, uh, I mean, what do you consider it could be a significant or, or, or the most um, um, experience that is supported by the ABED accreditation in terms of innovation, in innovative transformations in that way from the program? Okay, I will start. <laughs> uh, well, you, you could be, because, you know, I, I think on, you know, in both ways, you know, students and, and faculty, um, but I will go on with, with faculty, because yeah. uh, from our experience, uh, because you can think, you know, about PBL and, and having innovative practices in the classroom, but we, and here I'm talking about our university, our institution, 
uh, our experience um, like five, six years ago. Um, you know, you, you, you gather the data, well, you do the assessment, and then you, you evaluate, you know, those numbers and you try to find, you know, meaning. Uh, but our faculty, you know, we were wondering, you know, if we reflect just ourselves about, you know, our class, you know, why, why don't we just meet or get together, you know, and, and now we have this collaborative reflection sessions every summer, uh, just trying to, you know, get together and see through the program, you know, not just my class, but how, you know, this student outcome is developing, you know, from day one until the end. And so it has changed the way we see, you know, our program. And, and we talk. Sometimes uh, is, is the only time we have to get together and talk about, you know, what my class is, is providing to your class and how we see, you know, the, 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 the student outcome throughout the program. But it's is, is fulfilling, you know, seeing that we together are working towards, you know, developing those uh, skills. On students, so um, it's a uh, it's a way. It did change the way you know we reflect on our courses from the faculty you know perspective. Yes, I agree with Angelica. I I would like to add that the well the way that we evaluate students has improved a lot because in in engineering is well it's very common or, or it used to be a very common practice that we evaluate the students according to some particular criteria that only the professor knew, for instance. Maybe some students will, will know after they will evaluate it how was the evaluation provided. But I think the, the assessment process has helped us as professors to clarify what are those criteria that we're looking for when we're evaluating our students. For instance, uh, I assign a, a project in groups, so that's it. They're supposed to work in teams, and, and that's enough. If they finish the, the project, that should be a good teamwork. That's not the case. So we have to, we have to create or, or to decide on what are, what are the criteria for, for actually saying, okay, they did a very good team job. They actually learned to work in teams, not just by, by fulfilling a... Uh, homework or something like that. So I think that that's one of the very important values from ABET and that has been innovative for the culture of the faculty. I would like just to add one thing online uh, with what Umberto just said, because we are not constrained. Uh, as Jessica said, you know, we, ha we know what we have to do, but how to do it is, is, is up to us. And, and I have, as a department chair, have uh, faculty members who have raised their hands and say, I want to do, you know, flip classroom. I want to do PBL. I want just to tra transform my class. And they can just go ahead and do it. So it, it gives you room, you know. Y you can do, uh, you know, what, what you want to achieve, even your dream, because, you know, your classroom is, is, is your space but you're somehow free to innovate and do whatever you want to do, as long as you are able to meet, you know, uh, uh, your promise as a faculty member on, you know, what were the skills that you were to develop in your class. I love hearing the, the real experiences, the testimonials. At ABA, you know, we believe, you know, take a moment and think about a time when you were, at, when you were making great achievements you are at your best. You're, you're, you're creating new things. You're thinking differently. And then I want you to think about the people who were there with you when you were having those moments. Were they teachers? Were they peers? Were they editors? Were they uh, coaches? You know, And that's how ABET sees our relationship with innovation. We are there to make you challenge yourself to think things maybe deeper, differently, you know, and if ABET's the catalyst that made you do that, then we see ourselves also as the catalyst for innovation. We're not going to take credit for your innovative works or your new ideas, but we like to be able to think that maybe we had a little spark that we were able to provide um, to start thinking differently, to start looking at things differently, and maybe to start um, implementing improvements along the way. 
Yeah, and, and what, one of the things that we discover is like you can add innovation in the top of the criteria. I mean, in so multiple ways. I mean, um, here in Colombia, especially, I'm just continuing with the capstone design experience. I think that was one of the most transformative impacts that we have in terms of innovation in curriculums. I mean, having a senior design experience or a culminating major design experience before graduation, I think that's one of the things that, from my experience, I have seen in Colombia in curriculum for engineering as part of the innovation. A program is also use that for other innovations. I mean, I'm just have on the top of my mind the learning factory. I just have the, the chair of our mechanical engineering department who is here. Uh, and he has one of these uh, uh, flagship uh, innovations in terms of uh, how industry gets involved in those capstone design. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Jane and probably you, Jessica, that, that I was in a, in a mechanical engineering conference where all programs were ever accredited. And the department head of one of the most innovative mechanical engineering departments in the US, he was talking about all the innovations, all the changes that he did in the curriculum. And at the end of the presentation, he said, oh, by the way, ABED is okay with that. So I would say, like, you know, there's, there's actually no constraint. I mean, you can build innovation in the top of what you are committed with the continuous improvement part of your AB criteria. Uh, now continue with the industry uh, impact. Uh, one of the things that we really value is the voice from the industry uh, to the program. Uh, the speed, you know, the, the changes that are happening right now in different disciplines are so fast that we need permanent communication with the industry in terms to align our curriculums, our student experience, experiences when we, which, what is happening outside. So I would like to know your, your, your thoughts about that link that the ABER criteria promotes to hear the voice of the industry and how to you know, keep track of what is happening out there in the discipline, the problems that we need to solve now interdisciplinary uh, in terms of the ABER criteria. Yeah, in that regard, it's, it's really important um, the frequency you, you meet, and that's what we know, we have learned, I have seen in the programs, that I have evaluated that, you know, that link with industry, you know, must be there. As we saw, you know, the PLs that help us to see, you know, that um, guidance, you know, for our program. But it's, it's really fun to work with them, you know, because they're willing to share and just not uh, working with them in the advisory board, but trying to work with them in other uh, phases and other spaces in, in the program is also important. But I do remember for, you know, many years ago, our first visit, um, the PV, Dr. Kaufman, I asked him, you know, what's the quality of a program? And he says, it serves the purpose, you know, of the stakeholders and also industry. Those needs have to be met. You have to be, you know, close to them in order to hear, you know, what they need. Uh, to do what you have to do, you know, within your program and check on them, you know, frequently, more frequently now, but, you know, that is key. Mm, okay, so there's the first part, which is meeting through the advisory board mm -hmm. that must include people from industry and they should provide some important input. And as Angelica said, we also have included uh, people from industry to help us evaluate our capstone design projects. So that gives us a new perspective, and the students also give, gives them more perspective about what to, what to expect when they're going to present their projects. Uh, we also have some, some uh, social activities where we invite people from industry, and we have a, a, like a coffee with students, and so they can share experiences and, and talk, and, and so we get more, more information from them. So it's, it's very important for us to have the, the input from the industry. I just want to add one thing. I'm um, very fortunate to be able to observe uh, one uh, program evaluation a year, and I've been doing it for many years. And one thing I can say is that every time I'm, I'm there on site at an institution, we have an opportunity to meet with their industry advisors. And there has not been one time to where I've met to where an industry advisor hasn't said, we partner 
with these programs. It's a continuous partnership. They listen to us, we listen to them. We, you know, their graduates become our interns, become our employees. Um, so it's a, you, I've, I, every time I go, I see an ABET program, even a program, new program, I've never seen it to where the industry advisors, and I come from industry myself, not the same industry, but industry, um, so I sit down and I talk to them and I feel like I'm having a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. It's very honest, it's very open. And I can tell you, every single time, industry values that relationship with the programs just as much as the programs do having the insight from industry. Yeah, I, th I think that what, uh, what you mentioned about the advisory boards uh, and also uh, embedding or having the industry as part of the evaluation process from the student that will give you a tremendous new perspective. Uh, and actually students also promotes uh, what is in the part of the outcome is just to, well, you have to tell your story to different audiences, right? So it's not the same that you talk to your fac to the faculty, to the students, but now you have to present your word to industry representatives, so that gives you a new audience, right? So to build your, your skills on that. Um, so definitely, we are global citizens right now. And you mentioned all the the the, the problems and all the um, the things that our graduates need to tackle once they are out, out there in terms of technology, in terms of poverty, now climate change. You know, so there there's a lot of thing out there that now our graduates we are preparing for. I mean, just we have the, the student outcomes that we use as a pillars for our program educational objectives. Right, and we expect uh, certain years after graduation that they they achieve uh, those those objectives. So, um, in terms of global impact, um, what are your thoughts in terms of what is the most um, significant impact that you expect from graduates from Avida Creative programs in terms of the discipline, in terms of the profession, but also in terms of those skills and competencies that we mentioned just at the very beginning of the dialogue. Here I go. Um, I, I think that ABET provides like a common language for us to solve those challenging problems, those, you know, world problems, uh, because, you know, that common language, you know, we're problem solvers. As, but as we just, you know, talked about, you know, communicating, you know, understanding, you know, others' viewpoint, uh, ethics, uh, and having, you know, a set of tools that each engineer from, you know, either profession has uh, regarding that program criteria that it very carefully, you know, is just tailored through the, you know, the program uh, is key. So for me, you know, ABET provides that, you know, common language when we will face those challenges, you know, in this uh, interdisciplinary multicultural teams, we could be able to, you know, see it, you know, with the same uh, lenses in order to solve it. Yes, for me, ABET provides a common baseline for programs. So, because there may there may be many, many different programs in different institutions in different countries, and those engineers that graduate from those programs, uh, we don't know what what is the kind of, of education they received. When they all come from an accredited institution, uh, so we know that they fulfill the requirements of a common baseline. So we are, as you said, we are more confident on all the skills and the knowledge that they must have. So I think that's one one important feature of the global, uh, the global, uh, mm, <laughs> hmm? the global um, influence of AVET, mm -hmm. uh, which is providing a common line for programs and from, for the graduates. Just like the, the comment um, that every year over 2,000 students graduate from ABET accredited programs globally. And each one of them have been exposed to a program that meets ABET's criteria. So to just to build on what's been said, that's over 2,000 students graduating every year 
year after year after year. So we're creating an ecosystem in a large community of individuals who have graduated from programs that not only have the technical skills to say that they're able to enter now into the professions that are profic profic proficient entry level, mm -hmm. but also we now know that they're getting uh, exposure to sustainable design, to be to diversity, inclusion, working on teams. So I, I really think that that is what is it puts ABEC graduates. They they graduated from similar programs, all mm -hmm. of their programs. So they there's this network of professionals now that have all graduated from ABET accredited programs that if they were to meet would be able to discuss the similarities between how they've been educated and how they use those skills and abilities to in their professions, um, hopefully to improve society and to be the problem solvers of tomorrow. And ABET's working really hard um, to try to build a stronger community amongst our graduates. So I, I really believe within the next 18 months, keep your eye out, uh, you may see that ABET is, is sending a, maybe recognition to ABET graduates to where mm -hmm. they can say, I graduated from an ABET accredited program or one way or another, maybe through a badge, I don't know, I'm just saying, but uh, so we're working to make sure that they understand that they're part of this community and what that really means and how to leverage that. Well, so I think that this community, this network of professionals from uh, AVID graduates from AVID accredited programs, programs that are committed to the quality in education to have a global influence, as you mentioned, right? I think that that's, I can say, like a best closing remarks that I can take from this panel. So we, we really appreciate your, uh, your time being here um, to listen to us and to have the opportunity to know a little bit more about the transformation, the innovations uh, that are associated with what you are pursuing, AVER accreditation. And again, I don't know if I mentioned before, 3 p.m., 303A, we will be there just if you have additional questions for us or if you would like just to have a chat or a dialogue to know a little bit more about the process or any other topic that you are interested uh, related to your um, AVER accreditation desire or also uh, one of the aspects of the criteria. So thank you very much, Angelica, Maria Gabriela, Jessica. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure to share the stage with you. All right, thank thanks. You all.